on the eve of their wedding, the groom decides he needs to meet with his fiance. All the guests had arrived in town. The church was decorated. The bride was looking forward to a hot bath, a restful night's sleep, and then her big day. Instead, her fiance is across from her. And he's fumbling for words and he just simply says, I can't go through with it. She looks at him and she's not sure what to say. And finally, she makes this suggestion. She says, I'll tell you what. You show up tomorrow and stand up front and I'll be the one that doesn't appear. Well, that solved this problem. He wasn't sure what to do. And here she has provided him an out. And so he agrees to that. And so the next day, they, they, they're all there. And uh, he's up front with the pastor and the best man. And they play the wedding march. And the door opens. And here she comes right down the aisle with her husband or with her father. They get married, they go on the honeymoon, and finally he just has to know, what happened? (laughs) And she said, I knew you just had cold feet, and so I decided to take a risk, a, a holy risk, just to see if you would go through with it. It's always interesting to talk to couples. You ask them, how, how did you meet? Anything kind of strange happen at your wedding? Like we had the wrong band play at our wedding. We thought we got a rock band and they came from Lawrence Welk, I think. It was just kind of a different experience. And the story of Ruth chapter 3 is a story that seems to be leading towards a pathway to engagement that just has some bizarre things in it. And yet there's one amazing truth that that just saturates this book. It's this idea of a Hebrew word called kesed. The idea of kesed love. Kesed love goes beyond American love. American love is based on feeling. If we don't feel it, we don't think we're in love. But but for the Hebrews, kesed love described God's love. It, It was faithful. It had kindness. It had mercy. It was loyal. It was unfailing. All that kind of describes this idea of chesed love. And the beauty of the story, especially in this chapter, of three people, Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, is they not only know of God's chesed love, they live out God's chesed love. And this morning we're going to look into Ruth chapter 3. I invite you to pull out the gold insert or take notes on the gold insert in your order of service. We're going to start with the last verse, Ruth chapter 3, verse 18. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. As we get ready to dig into God's Word, let's go to Him in prayer. Thank you, God, that you do have a will for our lives. Holy Spirit, give us the patience to wait and the perseverance to work while we wait. As we look at your hand at work in the lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, help us to see your hand at work in our lives, too. We praise you for your great love for us and your desire to teach us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Today in chapter 3 of Ruth, the tide kind of turns. When the story started in chapter 1, Naomi's husband and two sons who have married all pass away. And they're living in a foreign land, Moab, and they hear there's food back in Naomi's home country. And so Naomi comes back to Bethlehem and Ruth commits to come with her. And Naomi, whose name means pleasant, uh, at the end of chapter 1 says, don't call me pleasant anymore, call me bitter. She said, I went away full and and, and God's kind of left me empty. And then in in the second chapter, uh, last week we saw that that God started to fill Naomi's emptiness. First it was with physical food. Ruth goes out and works in a barley harvest and basically gets whatever is left that the harvesters haven't gotten. And it's just full to overflowing. God blesses her work in an abundant way. Naomi's moved by that. And so now in chapter 3, she she decides that she needs to help this daughter-in-law, who's kind of been her champion, who has helped her through her process of grief. And this morning, we'll look at some just some strange customs. It's not how we do things. And yet this story of 3,200 years ago has some great lessons for us. So first we'll kind of work through the story and then we'll look at some of the lessons. Let's start in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. 
One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been a, a kinsman of ours? In the previous chapter, Boaz was kind of just a relative. And in this one, he's identified as a kinsman redeemer. Uh, that's kind of unique for Israel. A, a kinsman redeemer was somebody who was in your family who could be the champion. And so if you were about to lose your property to foreclosure, the kinsman redeemer would step in. If you were a woman and you were married and hadn't had children yet, the kinsman redeemer would marry you. And if you conceived and had a son, that would be along your dead husband's kind of family line there. Uh, this was just part of the, the laws there. Now, this led Sharon to pray for me often and for my health after I introduced her to my brother. <laughs> We, we don't know anywhere else in the world they did this. But we know kinsman redeemer because Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. There was a debt we could not pay for our sins. And he paid the price. He came and because he died and rose again, and we received that gift by faith, we are now part of God's family. We, we receive the inheritance. In that day, it was their version of kind of social security and life insurance. They, they didn't have it. And if you were a woman or a child and the husband passed away, this was the way they looked out to support each other. And so it's kind of a, a significant position. Uh, and it reflects this idea. Kessid is the kind of love that sacrifices. Kessid can be, be summarized as saying redeeming love. It sacrifices my benefit for your benefit. And that's what's kind of amazing about this story. Uh, Naomi sacrifices for Ruth. Ruth sacrifices for Naomi. Boaz sacrifices for both of them. Now, they'll receive benefit along the way, but the steps that they take in this story is always an opportunity to, to show that love. To live out that love. It was a reminder that, that God is perfect at Kessid love. But God empowers people still today to live out that love. And say, Naomi finds herself a bitter woman. And yet, she started to receive some grace from God. She begins to, to kind of warm up to the idea of, of expressing that love. And sometimes that happens. You're kind of throwing a pity party, and God will send you a little gift. And then he wants to see what, what you will do with it. Oh, look at how the story continues here in verses 2 through 5. Naomi says this to Ruth about Boaz. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. Okay, th this sounds a little risque. Naomi did not send Ruth to Boaz's house where he'd have his pajamas on. She sent him to the threshing floor. The threshing floor is where they would kind of work the harvest. And so they'd gotten all the barley in and now they're kind of threshing it. So you keep what's good, you get rid of the rest. And the threshing floor is where, where the crop would stay. And so the owner would kind of spend the nights there until they moved the crop to make sure that it didn't get stolen. They, they'd work hard all day and, and uh, it would take days to kind of bring that crop in so they could sell it. And to keep the workers motivated, they would work during the day. They would have a party at night. It probably was the original Miller time that happened uh, dating back to them. And so uh, Boaz would be fully clothed. He would be sleeping to guard the crop. Now, it's not the most socially acceptable step to take, but it's not outright scandalous either. And so Naomi comes up with this plan for Ruth, and uh, Ruth agrees to start working it out. Look what happens here in verses 6 through 9. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. 
In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. Well, isn't that an interesting question? The the Hebrew there is the exact same that Naomi will ask at the end of the chapter. It basically means what's happening, what's going on. And so Ruth Ruth replies to him. Now look what she says there in verse 9. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. Spread the corner of your garment over me. In other words, make me your wife. Uh, A couple years ago, Sharon's cousins were in town. And we went to Coronado, and then they wanted to go see Comic-Con because it was going on at that time. So we took the ferry boat over from Coronado uh, to the convention center, hung out there a little while, and then we took it back. And when we were headed back... This young guy gets on, he's carrying a couple bags. There's a, a family with him and what appears to be his girlfriend. And he hands me his phone and says, uh, videotape this, please. And so I'm holding the phone there at, towards the front of the boat where we're all seated. And all of a sudden he starts handing out like these T-shirts about Little Mermaid and balloons and stuff. And the whole time, the, the, the one I think's the girlfriend is going, no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden... He gets down on one knee. I almost said something into the camera at this point that I shouldn't have. And he goes, will you marry me? And I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. (laughs) Didn't say that one out loud, though. And amazingly, she says yes. Everybody cries. Well, except me. I just thought it was kind of funny myself. So if, a, if you're out to eat and a guy gets down on one knee at the table next to you and looks into the girl's eyes and he opens a little box with a ring in it, you, you kind of know what's coming. Ruth pops the question here. Between you and me, I wish Sharon had done that for me. That would have been awesome. Instead, I had to take her parents out to dinner. I ordered a glass of wine, which I rarely do. They didn't, which they always did back then. I thought I was in deep trouble. When I got back to her house, I asked her to marry me. What seemed like my definition of eternity, the whole second and a half, it took her to say yes. Uh, I could have avoided that whole thing. But but Ruth kind of steps out here. She takes a risk. And she does it for Naomi. She doesn't just simply say, marry me. She says, marry me and be our kinsman redeemer. She wants Naomi to be cared for. Naomi could have taken this path and followed somebody who would have watched over her. And then when Naomi passed, the the, the land that her family had rights to would go to that individual. And she could have just said, Ruth can take care of herself. Or Ruth could have said, Naomi's got family here. She can lean into that family. I'm going to start my own life here. But neither one does that. They're willing to sacrifice what could be theirs to help the other. And so Ruth kind of pops the question. Uh, Look how Boaz replies here uh, in verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. So Everybody here is looking out through Kesed, through this idea of redeeming love. Naomi looks out for Ruth. Ruth looks out for Naomi. Boaz is going to look out for both of them. What's interesting to me is um, he didn't answer the question yet, did he? I'm almost thinking that he's going to go through this thing. You're so kind. You're so wonderful. Uh, I don't know women ever use this line. You're, You're like a sister to me. I heard the brother line a few times when I was dating, and uh, I just hated that line. And uh, you, 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 you kind of wonder what, what, what's going to happen here. And, and, and so Boaz continues. Look what he says here in verses 11 through 13. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. What's always surprising about Boaz is he listens to Ruth. 
He responds to Ruth. You, you might think that's obvious to do, but in, in their culture, there, there were like 15 rungs to the ladder. And Boaz's slot is at the top of the ladder. He, he's on rung 15. And Ruth's slot on the social ladder is she's at the very bottom. And typically, there, there wasn't much engagement between rung, rung the first rung <laughs> and the 15th one. And yet, with Boaz, there is. Boaz lets Ruth push the gleaning laws in chapter 2 in terms of, of harvesting his crop for herself to the max. And now she's pushing the kinsman redeemer law to the max as well. Boaz could have easily said, look, I'm not, I'm not directly related. I'm not first in line. I'm not the brother. I'm just a cousin. And yet Boaz guarantees almost a safety net for Ruth and Naomi. This guy is in line before me. If he says yes, good. If he doesn't say yes, it's still good. I'll take care of you. Redeeming love reaches out and embraces people. It welcomes them in. And and Boaz just, just demonstrates this idea of chesed love. To look out for Ruth and Naomi. Uh, the wait will continue until morning. Look what happens here in verses 14 through 16. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized, and he said, Don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured it into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother in law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Same question Boaz asked, just a little, translate a little bit differently. And Boaz, she gives him the update. Look at what she says here in verses 16 through 18. Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, till you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. That's where chapter 3 ends. We'll see how it turns out next week in, in chapter 4. But But consider these three lessons that kind of flow out of the story we just looked at. Here's the first one. God's care for you works best when you care for others. Naomi could have found a solution that would have just helped her. Ruth could have done the same thing. And Boaz could have just put his hands up. But they all demonstrate Kessid's redeeming love. They sacrifice for the needs of the other. And so when you're looking to to, to solve a situation that you and multiple people are involved in, uh, in the eyes of the world, it's okay just to take care of number one. What what, what just helps me in this situation? But Kessid love invites us, calls us, challenges us, empowers us to look for a solution that, that doesn't just benefit oneself, but even more benefits other people. And when you think of what God desires to bless, is it just self-serving benefit? Or is it it the kind of love that that helps other people? And so as you live out out God's care, as He blesses you, you use that to bless other people. Here's a second way. The right way often calls for a leap of faith. This is a, Naomi's plan's got a lot of risk with it. Ruth could have been seen. Boaz could have been offended. And so they kind of take a, a leap of faith to, to get there. And faith requires a calculated risk. We, we like kind of the guarantee. God, just tell me every step in the plan, and I'll follow that. And sometimes they're They're marked out and they're easy. And sometimes to get from A to B, it's not an easy step. It's a running leap. And you don't always know how it's going to turn out. God does. But but we don't. And that's part of faith. That's part of trust. Same thing with the third lesson. God's best plans still face human obstacles. It's not a done deal yet at the end of chapter 3. We're not sure how it's going to turn out at the end of chapter 3. Will will Boaz marry Ruth or will this other guy 
marry Ruth. Uh, well, we'll have to wait and see till next week. I'm always amazed. Some people think that, well, God's plan, God's plan sh- shouldn't like every door open. When people think that God's plan is just easy street, that one thing falls into place and another thing falls into place, and there's never any problems, that, that rarely happens for me. Typically, when you follow God's plan, there are obstacles along the way. And obstacles are challenging. Sometimes they, they get us off the road. What I discover they do is they, they, they invite me to, to lean into God more. To trust Him, to embrace Him, to follow Him, to receive His love, to to express that love. God, God pays attention to what's going on in your life. Even when there's a delay, He's paying attention. Even when there's an obstacle, He knows. Today's a significant step for Ruth. Because she trusts God. She, she, risks, she risks it for God's miraculous blessing in her life. And so what are the terms for waiting? It's that, not that you give up and quit. It's not just that you let go and let God. There's times to do that, but there, there are times where, where that becomes an excuse. I, I, I'm out of this completely. The terms for waiting are this. As you work and wait, Surrender to God, not your circumstances. Circumstances can overwhelm, but as you work and wait, you surrender to God, not to your circumstances. We bow our heads to pray. Thank you, O God, for caring about our lives and working in our lives to know when to work and wait for your will. Holy Spirit, wire our hearts to love others more than we love ourselves. May the chesed love we see in the story of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz be seen at work in our lives. As we wait for your will, give us the courage to work out what we know of your will, to take holy risks when called for, and overcome obstacles along the way so that your will is done. We praise you for your great purpose and plan for our lives. We praise you, Lord Jesus. You are our kinsman redeemer who died for our sins that we might have life with you now and for all eternity. In your name I pray. Amen.